Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma, and I welcome you back to my program here on Now TV. I do appreciate you being with us, uh, and uh, I'm continuing uh, my examination of the challenge of Christ. Now, last week I went, went back over an awful lot of territory, so I'm not going to rehash that, not going to recapitulate all of that. Uh, I, I hope that you know by now, number one, what the challenge of Christ is. Jesus said, if I don't do what I say I'm going to do, don't believe me, okay? One of the things that he said he was going to do was to come in the glory of the Father with his angels in judgment in the first century. Oh, by the way, just this morning, I was reading in one of these, quote, scholarly commentaries and in a uh, scholarly article that, Hey, if we take Jesus at his word, everybody knows he failed. See, that's the challenge of Christ, folks. Th this is what the scholars say, most of them. And so what I've been sharing with you is that th this failure to understand apocalyptic language. Uh, in another article, uh, actually it's quite a wonderful article, uh, by uh, Crispin Fletcher Lewis, uh, a woman She's done some marvelous work, and she has begun to see that this language of the destruction of heaven and earth is the, is the language that the ancient Jews used to describe the fall of the temple, the destruction of the temple. And so she has written this article entitled, let me get my glasses here, Jesus, the Temple, and the Dissolution of Heaven and Earth. Now, like I said, it's a great article. Uh, I, I don't agree with every single word that she says, but the gist of her argument is that, that modern commentators, modern scholars ha have just failed tragically to tap into the Hebraic worldview, the Hebraic use of apocalyptic language, the, the Hebraic use of metaphoric language, and to associate that with the destruction of the temple. Instead, scholarship, Bible students have said, look, the Bible says when Jesus comes, it's the destruction of heaven and earth, 2 Peter chapter 3. Earth and heaven are still here, therefore Jesus didn't come. But again, as Crispin Fletcher Lewis points out, uh, that's just a failure to understand Hebraic thought, Hebraic literature, and she really does a great job. Uh, of that. So, I have been sharing with you how Peter predicted the last days, the last days day of the Lord, when the Lord would come to destroy creation. I've shared with you how that is from Isaiah chapters 2 through 4, and how Jesus, Paul, and John all quoted from the same identical verse about the day of the Lord, and that it proves beyond a shadow of a doubt from Isaiah chapter 2 that the day of the Lord under consideration could not be an earth-burning, time-ending, uh, history-ending uh, event. Now, last Friday, I began a more in-depth look at Isaiah chapters 2 through 4. You know, we've been focused on Isaiah chapter 2, 2 through 4, Isaiah 2, 9 to, 9 to 11, and Isaiah 2, 19 to 21. But you see, those verses... Uh, don't stand in isolation from one another. They do not stand in isolation from chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5. Isaiah 2 through 5 is one united prophecy. It is, <coughs> pardon me, it's not to be divided up into a discussion of, oh, well, Isaiah's day and then Jesus' day and then the end of time. No, no, no. There's not, a, there's not a single syllable. There's not a single word in these verses to indicate such a dichotomization of these chapters and of these verses. As a matter of fact, when we look at the terminology that is used in Isaiah 2 through 5, <clears throat> we find this little term, in that 
day. Now, that little term refers to the antecedent discussion, okay? So whenever we find that term in that day, in Isaiah chapters 2 through 5, we need to look and we need to honor the fact of the previous discussion. And when we do that, we realize that, once again, the, this day of the Lord of Isaiah 2 cannot be an earth-burning, time-ending event. It is rather a prediction of a historical day of the Lord. Now, what do I mean by a historical day of the Lord? Here, ladies and gentlemen, is the stark contrast between covenant eschatology and historical eschatology. I have been presenting to you the reality of covenant eschatology. And what I mean by that is that when the Bible talks about the end, when it talks about the end of the age, when it talks about the end of the last days, it is never talking about the end of time. Did you know, did you know that the term end of time never appears in the Bible? Now, I should give this little caveat. In Daniel chapter 12, in one, one translation of the New American Standard, one one translation that was given, let me see if I'm not mistaken, it was 1987 version, and they actually rendered it as end of time. Well, I tell you, the scholarly response to that translation was so overwhelmingly against it, guess what they did? They changed it. Because they knew the text does not say, the Hebrew of the text and the Septuagint of the text does not say end of time. Now, don't you think and listen to me, I'm not arguing that the term end of time has to appear in every text. That discusses time of the end. I'm not suggesting that. What I am suggesting to you, however, is that if the doctrine of end of time is as prevalent, is as common as most commentators claim that it is, you would think that we would have at least one reference to end of time. But we don't. You know what we find instead? Time of the end. End of the days. In other words, the end of the appointed days. And we find the use of the word kairos in which the New Testament writers, and the Old, by the way, in the Septuagint, talked about the coming of the Kairos, the divinely appointed time. And then we find me, uh, apostles and writers, such as 1 Peter saying, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, the divinely appointed time. The end, which is the divinely appointed time of the end has drawn near. I mean, after all, folks, how much clearer could it get? Now, notice, Peter doesn't say the end of time has drawn near. And no biblical writer does. So, what I've been presenting to you is the idea, essentially presented in Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, the apostles asked him, and no, they were not confused. You know, uh, the, the claim that Jesus' apostles were confused uh, li underlies most futurist eschatology. But in my brand new book, Watching for the Parousia, were Jesus' apostles confused? I, I address head on the claim that when Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem and the temple, the apostles wrongly thought about the end of the current Christian age. Well, it is most assuredly true they thought about the end of some age. They just didn't say the end of that age. And listen to me, folks, they were still living in the old covenant age. They were still living under Moses in the law. And that temple represented that covenant age. 
didn't represent Christian age, didn't represent the gospel of Christ. It represented Moses and the law. So for Jesus to predict the, the destruction of that temple meant the end of that age, that covenant age, and thus he was talking about covenant eschatology, the end of a covenant age. Now that's opposed to the idea, as most commentators hold, then in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3, when the disciples asked, tell us what, what should be the sign of your coming in the end of the age, that they're talking about the end of time. And they're talking about the end of the Christian age. They're talking about the end of the gospel. Well, listen, folks, the gospel has no end. The Christian age has no end. Paul wrote, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, unto him be glory in the church throughout all ages, age without end, and amen. Now listen to me very carefully. If the Christian age has no end, then it's absolutely specious and untenable and unbiblical to talk about the end of the Christian age or the end of time. Hello? Christian age has no end. Christian age is the current age in which we are living. Therefore, <clears throat> the age in which we are living now has no end. That means there is no end of history. You see, historical eschatology is about the end of human history and the end of time. But those terms never appear in the Bible. The Christian age has no end. So historical eschatology posits the end of time, the end of, uh, the end of the universe. Covenant eschatology predicted and predicted, predicts the end of the old covenant age of Israel, which happened with the dissolution of the temple in AD 70. That's why our study of Isaiah chapters 2 through 5 is so important. Because it is about the last days, the last days, day of the Lord, <clears throat> when the Lord would come and destroy creation. You see, I was raised believing, probably just like you, that the prediction of the day of the Lord at the end of the last days has to be the end of time. It has to be the destruction of the earth and the elements therein, 2 Peter chapter 3, 10 and following, in a literal, physical, materialistic way. But you see, just like Crispin Fletcher Lewis says in her article, and by the way, in my book, The Elements Shall Melt with Fervent Heat, I quote her extensively, as well as a host of other scholars, both ancient and modern, who realize that Peter's prediction in 2 Peter 3 had nothing to do with the end of time. So you, you have to realize that the view that I am presenting to you on this program is not a brand spanking new view. It's not something that I invented at all. No. It is in truth and in fact a very old well accepted in many scholarly circles view. Just all there is to it. Now, to continue our, our study, what I began sharing with you last week <clears throat> is that when we go into Isaiah chapter 3, we learn very, very quickly that this day of the Lord of Isaiah 2, 19 to 21 is a time of the judgment of Jerusalem and Judah. So let's go back over that very, very quickly. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock and the store, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. Now, folks, again, how much clearer could language be? This is a judgment of Jerusalem and Judah. When would it occur? In the last days. In, at the last days, day of the Lord, when the Lord would arise to
to shake the earth mightily. Now, I've got a question for you, and I want you to ponder this very, very well. Now, keep in mind, I was raised as a fifth generation amillennialist. And let me remind you that my, my view of eschatology, my view of Israel, my view of the law of Moses, was that God was through with Israel at the cross. God was through with the law of Moses at the cross. And on the day of Pentecost, the last days, which is the Christian age, began. But you see, in the last days, God is no longer dealing with Old Covenant Israel. He is not fulfilling His promises to Old Covenant Israel. He is dealing with the church. Totally separate, totally distinct from Israel. Now, you have to understand, that's essentially the view of the post-millennial world as well. Did you realize that all three futurist views of eschatology say the law of Moses ended at the cross. Did you realize that? Thomas Ice, a leading dispensationalist with whom I've had four debates, but he refuses to, de to debate me again. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Thomas Ice says the law of Moses passed away at the cross. And that's the view of the majority of commentators. Well, okay. So the majority view of the commentators, once again, is God was through the old covenant Israel at the cross. God was through the law of Moses at the cross. Beginning on Pentecost, the last days began. The last days are to be identified as the Christian age. Kenneth Gentry, in his book, he shall have dominion, published in 2009, says the last days refer to the Christian age, the age in which we are now living. Do you realize how important it is to identify properly the last days? Here's how simple it is. If you and I are not in the last days, okay, if you and I are not in the last days, it means that there is no last days day of the Lord. You see how easy that is? I wrote a book some years ago entitled The Last Days Identified. <clears throat> and I'll never forget a little, little anecdote here. I was teaching a class at church on this very idea. And I got a call from some of the members, uh, a family, one night to go over to their house. And I sat down, we small talked, had a good visit. And finally, the, uh, the husband said, Don, I want to make sure I understand something. He said, first of all, he said, are you saying the Lord's already come? I said, well, based upon the scriptures I've been sharing with you, I'm going to turn that around and I'm going to ask you, what are you seeing from Scripture? He said, okay, okay, I see where you're coming from. But he said, okay, the next question is, he said, you've been teaching us that the last days do not refer to the Christian age. He said, is that true? I said, that is true. He said, well, then you just answered my first question. And I said, well, actually, yes, I did. He said, because anybody can see if we're not in the last days, it's all over. There is no future end of time. There is no end of the last days. There is no coming of the Lord at the end of the last days. He said, that's unanswerable. And I said, you're exactly right. That's exactly what I believe. Okay. <clears throat> So, to reiterate, since Isaiah chapters 2 through 5 are speaking about the last days, the last days, day of the Lord, when the Lord would come to destroy the creation, if it is true that the last days 
refer to the Christian age, totally separate and distinct. I mean, sharp division, no connection, no relationship between the last days and Israel's covenant age. If, in fact, the last days is strictly about the gospel and the new covenant, and that God was through with Israel at the cross, God was through with the old covenant at the cross, then we have to ask ourselves the question, how is it that in Isaiah chapters 2 through 4, 2 through 5, Isaiah, number one, is predicting the last days. He is predicting the last days, day of the Lord, but it would be the day of the Lord when men could run, <coughs> if you remember, when men could run to the mountains, hide in the caves, and cry to the rocks, fall on us. Because you see, if the last days are the Christian age, and if the last days day of the Lord is the end of time that's over in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, nobody has a chance. I've said this many times, but I'm going to keep saying it, right? <clears throat> nobody has a chance to run to the mountains, run to the hills, hide in the caves. Thirdly, this day of the Lord, this last day's day of the Lord, would be, as chapter 3 describes it, a time of judgment on Jerusalem and Judah. Now, here is the question. I posed this briefly last week. But boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, you have to catch the power of this. If the last days of the Christian age, and if the last days have nothing to do with the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises, and if the last days have nothing to do with the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel, and if the last days have nothing to do with old covenant Israel, then how in the world, how in the world is God in Isaiah chapter 3 in describing the last days, the last days day of the Lord as a time of judgment on Jerusalem and Judah. Folks, it doesn't work. Because if we take Israel and completely set them aside at the cross and we begin the last days, on Pentecost, having nothing whatsoever to do with Old Covenant Israel, having nothing whatsoever to do with the fulfillment of God's Old Covenant promises made to Old Covenant Israel, then how do we explain the fact that in Isaiah chapter 3, he is talking about the last days, the last days day of the Lord, as a judgment on Jerusalem and Judah? Well, I was in a formal public debate in New York some years ago with two uh, reformed amillennialists. And I brought up <clears throat> some Old Covenant promises made to Old Covenant Israel. The main spokesman for the pair, there were two of them, got up and he said, well, what Preston fails to realize is that um, these Old Testament promises of the judgment on, quote, Israel, are promises of judgment on the church as Israel. Well, I promptly went to Isaiah chapters 2 through 4. And I did a really, really brief exegesis of it, pointing out, well, it says Jerusalem and Judah. And it says it would be a famine. So the question is, are we, since we're supposedly living in the last days, are we looking for a time in our future in which there's going to be a literal physical famine in the church? Because that's what this predicts. Not only that, he goes ahead to say, the mighty man and the man of the war, the judge, the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor and the skillful artisan and the expert enchanter will say, uh, I will give children to be your princes 
and babes shall rule over you. The people will be oppressed, every one by another and every one by his neighbor. The child will be insolent toward the elder and the base toward the honorable. That's supposed to be the church? Look, there is absolutely nothing in Isaiah chapter 3 that has to do with the church being under judgment in the last days. Now, let's go down, for time's sake, because I'm running out of time here, to Isaiah chapter 3, verse 13. Now, remember, this is in that day, all right? It is the day in which it's the day of the Lord, the last days, day of the Lord, And he says, the Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes, for you have eaten up the vineyard. Now, keep that terminology of the vineyard in mind because you see over here in chapter 5 of Isaiah, the vineyard is defined as Old Covenant Israel. Not the church, not the new covenant body, old covenant Israel. So the text itself delimits its discussion of the last days, the last days day of the Lord, when the Lord would come to destroy creation as a time of judgment on Judah and Jerusalem and the elders of Judah and Jerusalem Because you have eaten up the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts. Okay, I'm almost out of time. What have we seen? We have driven home the point that Isaiah chapter 2 through 5 is about the last days, the last days day of the Lord when men could run to the mountains. It is a time of judgment on Israel, a time of judgment on Jerusalem and Judah. And it cannot be a judgment of the church. I'm out of time. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you next week.